back you'll find there's a bag with information about the church in it, as well as a loaf of bread baked by Great Harvest Bakery as a gift to you. It's delicious. We hope that you will receive that as a sign of our welcome and enjoy to be in worship with you. Calvary is a church where faith is fostered, community is cherished, and Christ's love thrives. Let us celebrate all of that in the midst of worship this day. Would you stand now as you're able, as we worship together, singing, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. We come now to the time in our worship in which we bow in prayer to God and with one another. I will lead us in a short prayer and then we will have an opportunity to name aloud a situation or a person that God has laid on our hearts this morning. After each one is named, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite you to respond by saying, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, as we gather today in worship to proclaim your mighty name, we thank you for the gift that that is. We thank you for the sunshine these past several days. We thank you for friends, family, and the fellowship that your church offers to all of us. 
Almighty God, your love is overflowing. And in all our moments, moments of grief and gladness, brokenness and beauty, when the world seems to go astray and our human abilities fail, we rely on your love, your compassion, your amazing grace, the grace that surpasses our human understanding. And so, Lord, as we come together and worship, we thank you for all of these things. But, Lord, our hearts are also heavy, heavy from the atrocities of violence happening here in the United States, in the Ukraine, and all around the world. We ask that you would help us to be the peacemakers, to seek justice and mercy in order to be who you've called us to be. Gracious and loving God, we ask that you would clean our hearts of distrust, free us from all iniquity so that we may regain the vision of your kingdom of peace, hope, and love that you instilled in our being since the time we were conceived in our mother's womb. When our human knowledge and skills to unite fail, Lord, grant us your wisdom. Wisdom to imagine and dream new ways to usher in your kingdom here on earth. Gracious and loving God, disturb us enough that we may show empathy to our neighbors. Stir in our hearts your courage to dream big dreams beyond the seas of compassion for all your children. God, we ask that you would give us grace Enough grace to see you and all our siblings in our human experiences. And as we continue gathering together this morning, Lord, renew your gentle spirit here in this sacred space. Renew our faith. Renew us to be bold to proclaim Christ here. We ask this in your matchless, healing, redeeming name. Lord, as we continue in prayer, we ask that you would now receive these, the prayers for individuals or circumstances that you have placed on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. For the prayers of those lifted online, Lord, in your mercy. Now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us all pray the prayer Jesus taught us by praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 16 through 20. Here, Christ reminds his disciples to keep the faith, that no matter what, the Holy Spirit will give the tools necessary to overcome adversary. Let us listen to and for the word of God. I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents, and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
Hello. <laughs> I am Nicole Brown, for those who don't know, the communications director here at Calvary, and welcome to another Children's Time. So today we're going to talk about exercising your faith in prayer. So children, I know wherever my children are, I know that you receive Bibles. You all should have your Bibles by now. And when you get a chance, I want you to read the chapter Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. And, and grown-ups, you read it too, okay? <laughs> Hebrews 11 verse 1 basically says that faith is the evidence of the unseen. So that means that we believe in God and the things of God, even though we don't see him and even, we don't know, even though we don't know for sure. So what are some things that you believe, but you cannot see? So we know one is God, right? And the angels and Jesus, right? Well, what, what's one other thing that you believe, you know it's there, but you can't see it. Gravity is one. What's that? Love, yes, that's another one. You can definitely feel that one too. Air is one. Air is all around us. We believe it's there, we know it's there. We breathe in the oxygen from the air. Air, right? So. When you pray, you believe, you have faith that God will help you, even though you don't see. And I will show you what will happen when you pray with faith. So this is a prayer with faith. have to make sure I don't lose my prayer. <laughs> well, this is a prayer with faith. You mind tying this? Don't lose the prayer, Pastor Jane. while she does that one. I'm going to show you a prayer without faith. It's hard to pray without faith. doesn't have faith, but we still need it. So here is a nice prayer with faith. You see that prayer? It's nice and flo it floats. It can float on up to God. This person believed and they trusted that God would help them in prayer. And it wasn't that hard because they weren't trying to do anything on their own. They had faith and trust in God. And Jesus can help you with that. Let's look at our prayer without faith. Look at that sad prayer with no faith. <laughs> it doesn't float. It doesn't do anything. What can we do with that? But I'll have you know that it's almost impossible not to have faith when you pray. Because Jesus said you only need a little teeny easy beasy bit of faith, the size of a mustard seed, Pastor Matthew told us a few weeks ago. And a mustard seed is very, very tiny. That's all you need. And Jesus can help you pray. That's it. You don't need to hustle like I did with that prayer. 
You don't need to do that. So let us pray. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Sunday, and we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and the promises that you've made to us, even though we don't see and we don't know for sure. We ask you, Jesus, to please help increase our faith. Help us to believe where we don't believe. Amen. Our second scripture today comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 17. Here, Paul instructs and encourages all of us to put on the armor of God in order to stand strong in the faith. Hear now the word of the Lord. 
Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness, as shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. May the Lord write these words upon our hearts, and may we seek to understand them more through the message today. Amen. asking that you speak, for we, your servants, are listening. Make the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable before you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The year is 312 AD, October 28th, and we have before us what has become known as the Battle of Milvian Bridge. The setting is Rome, the holy city of Rome, before it becomes a holy city. This is back when it's pagan rule and the emperors are not just one but many there's a tetrarchy after Diocletian the emperor Diocletian in which there are different emperors throughout the Roman Empire in time they're not content with allowing there to be other emperors as well and so they start fighting with each other to declare who would be named Caesar Augustus of the whole of the Roman Empire a guy named Maxentius has conquered one of the other Caesars in the city of Rome and now has his battalion there in Rome. But he hears word that there is another Caesar, another one who wants to become the emperor of the entire empire, named Constantine on his way to come and take over the, the city of Rome and the Roman Empire. And so he prepares his troops. He goes to the Milvian Bridge Knowing that it's not large enough, he builds pontoons so that his 20,000 troops and he himself can go over the bridge and attack Constantine's troops when they arrive. Constantine marches from the Gaulish region, from all the way up in what is today northern England. He marches down. He has 40,000 troops and they whittle those down. And he comes before Exendius with 20,000 troops as well. They're evenly matched. And, and then that night, they go to bed preparing for the battle the next day. Maxentius makes the decision to go across the bridge and the pontoon to be on the other side and have the river at his backside. Not a good idea. Constantine goes to bed and has a vision. Do you know what happened in that vision? What he saw in his dream? In his dream, he, a pagan, had a vision of Christ coming to him and speaking. And Jesus of Nazareth, whom he had not believed in, speaks to him and says, By this sign you shall conquer. And what was the sign? It was the actual name of Christ. In Greek, Christ is Christos, and the first two letters are the chi rho, which in our eyes look like an X and a P together. And he woke that morning with that image in his mind. And according to the historians who, went down, who have shared it in human history, 
they share that that next morning he got up and upon his banners of his troops and upon the shields of his troops, he puts the sign of Christ on all of those. He has painted upon them the sign of Christ upon their shields. And the battle ensues. And what happened? Well, you know the story, don't you? Maybe you don't. But what happens is Maxentius gets retreated, finds himself falling off the, the pontoon bridge into the river and is conquered. And Constantine is victorious and becomes the, the emperor of the Roman Empire. And now we're in a situation, a peculiar situation, because in case you didn't know, Christianity is illegal. It was illegal to be a Christian. Now, there was a Pax Romana, which was to say that there was an official doctrine of toleration of other religions, whether or not you worship uh, this god or, or this goddess. It was uh, permitted as long as you still would bend the knee and worship the emperor as a god. But guess who would not do that? Christians would not do that. And so under people like Emperor Nero, we were, we were put in his gardens and lit on fire to shed light in his gardens or, or put in the middle of the Colosseum and torn apart men, women, and children, Christians uh, by the animals, the tigers and lions and bears, literally tearing the Christians apart, horribly persecuted. But now we have the emperor himself coming to faith in Christianity. And so what does he do? He says, well, upon the shield, I put the sign of Christ it was in the name of Christ that I was victorious. And so I can't allow anymore for us to persecute Christians. And so he doesn't make it legal. He doesn't make it that you have to be Christian. That is not the law. But he does change Christianity from becoming from an illicit religion to illicit religion, to a legal status. You are then allowed to be a Christian and say, I bend the knee only to Christ. I believe only in God as the Almighty and not in a pantheon of other gods or worshiping of idols. And you would be protected, not immediately, not in every part of the empire, but that was the official law. Why did I tell you this story? I'm so glad you asked. It's not just because I love history, which you know already. The reason is, we're talking about the shield today. And what did Constantine put upon the shield? He put his faith, actually, in Christ in that moment. And he believed that it is in the name of Christ, in the symbol of Christ, that he would be victorious. We're in a sermon series called The Whole Armor of God. We're talking about that passage that we had read this morning from Ephesians chapter 6, where the Apostle Paul is talking to the people in Ephesus. And he says, listen, Christians, you're going to face all kinds of battles, but there are spiritual battles that, we're supposed to, that we will engage in. He did not encourage physical battles. He did not encourage warfare. But he did say, whether you're a peaceful person or not, there's going to be a spiritual battle that you're going to engage in. There are going to be times in which your, your patience is tested. The peace of Christ within you is going to erupt into a warfare, if you will. And you'll be tested on whether or not you're a person who genuinely possesses a, a joy in the Lord and a love of God. And whether you really mean the well-being for the enemy as well as your friend as Christ commanded. He said, that will be a spiritual battle for you. And so you need to be equipped today. Equipped because... You don't necessarily have all the resources, but God has the capacity to make it possible that you can defend yourself spiritually from all that would rob you of life. And so we, in the last several weeks, we've talked about the breastplate of righteousness. Not self-righteousness, but genuine righteousness. Hungering after a heart like God's. We talked about having a belt of truth, repre representing God's truth, not our own individual understanding of what truth is. And we talked about having shoes of peace, which Pastor Jan preached on last Sunday. Today we talk about the shield of faith. And how it's important for me to say, I'm not talking about a, a shield of faith in myself or a shield of, of, of vibranium like Captain, uh, Captain America carries, right? Captain America's shield. I'm talking about a shield of faith. And what Christ, what Paul is saying to us is, as Christians, there are going to be things that are coming at us. There's, well, he says it like this. He says that the shield of faith will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And so he's inferring that you're going to have things coming at you at all angles. And this is going to be able to be a, a defense for the things that are near, close in battle, as well as distant shots at you, things coming from afar. There will be problems that you're going to face as a Christian from afar and from within. And he's saying, I want you to know, want you to know 
that you can, you can be shielded by a faith in Christ. Not in yourself, not in the church, not in your parents, not in your 401k, but, but a faith in Christ can shield you from that which would rob you otherwise of faith and life and joy. It's important, I think, to give an illustration of this, maybe a negative illustration and an affirmative illustration. From the Old Testament, gospel, the, the, the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me. Um, I've been asked, by the way, why we don't have the pew Bibles in the pews anymore. And we did for years. We had the, the Good News translation. But I so rarely quoted from the Good News translation, which was a modern translation from the 1970s. At that point, it was a transliteration. I used the New Revised Standard translation most in my preaching. So this is what I'm going to say to you. We're not going to put those back in but I want to invite you to bring your own Bible. I want to equip you to have a Bible and to use your Bible. Turn there, and if your Bible is on your phone, that is permitted as well. No cross looks when you're looking at your phone during the sermon. I'm just going to presume the best in you, and I'm going to assume you're reading the Scriptures. Amen? All right. So we turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, and we find there, after the creation, right, the the six days, have, and God has created on the sixth day, humanity, male and female, God created them. In God's image, God created them, which is a beautiful thing that we believe, right? We believe that male and female, God has created us equally with sacred works. In God's image, God has created male and female. There's not one that's, that's more worthy than the other. It, it's, it's a representation. God says, I'm giving to you, you're the paradigm of my creation. And you are a great blessing. And you reflect God's nature more than any other part of God's creation can reflect God's nature. Both because of your consciousness, but also because of your creativity and your relational dyna dynamics with God and with one another. All these different ways were made in the image. And then God rests on the seventh day. And then we have in chapter 3 this narrative about the Garden of Eden. And it says something like this. It says, and then there was in the garden the serpent. It was more crafty than all the other animals that God had created. And the serpent came to Eve and asked a question. Now, Eve had already had a conversation with Adam, and Adam had already had a conversation with God. And the conversation that had already happened was something like, Hey, Adam, here's the Garden of Eden. It's for your blessing. It's for Eve's blessing. Enjoy it. Uh, work the land, but uh, reap the benefits of a, of a blessing of this perfect place where there is no evil and there's no sin. And God said, but there's one thing you don't want to eat from. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. For if you eat of it, you will surely die. Well, Adam apparently has the conversation with Eve saying, don't go near it, don't look at it, don't touch it, and certainly don't eat it. And so this is the conversation that's already ensued. The serpent says, Oh, Eve, yes, did God say you can't eat from any of the trees in the garden? She's like, N no, no, that's not what God said, which is already, this is good. At least she's saying no. <laughs> she said, no, God said we couldn't eat, we could eat from all of the trees, but God did say we cannot eat from the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, for if we touch it, we shall surely die. And the serpent says, oh, oh, Eve, no, you're not going to die if you eat of that. That's, that's not true. God told you this? Yeah. Well, God doesn't want you to be like God. I mean, it's going to open your mind to things that you can't conceive of today. So, Eve, you're not going to die and it's a great blessing. And look at it. Don't you want to eat that? And, and then the next passage is Eve uh, notices three things about the fruit. She says, first of all, she believes now it's good to eat, number one. Which is, I would suggest to you, taking the shield of faith and putting it down. She's already decided that she's willing to believe anything's word over God's word. Whatever we supplant with God's word is putting down the shield of faith. And she says, oh, okay, I'm going to believe it is good to eat. And then she goes, and it looks really delicious. <laughs> so it, it's appealing to the eye. It's eye candy. It, it look, well, and if it looks that good, then how can I resist? 
And so she goes, it, it looks good, and I'm sure it's good to eat because the serpent says so. And, and lastly, I want my mind open to things I don't understand. I want to I, I conceive of those things. I want to be more like God in that way. And so what does she do? She takes of the fruit, and she eats. And in that same passage, she says, and she shares it with Adam. And Adam, who doesn't have this conversation with the serpent, what does he do? Does he go, Eve, Eve, didn't we talk about this? Does he say, well, now who gave you this, or which fruit is it? No, he doesn't do any of that. He goes, okay. And I'm glad that we feed each other, amen? That's good. The humans feed each other. It's good to make a meal, but, but be mindful of what you're consuming is part of the message here. Be mindful of the threat that comes from within as well as, as, well as that from without. And so in the next moment, they are aware of what they were not aware of in the past. For the first time, humanity, by the way, Adam can be translated either as earth or human, uh, depending on the translation, so human, and Eve's name means life, human life. This is us, by the way, this is us. This is you and me and them. And in this next moment, they're aware for the first time of the difference between good and evil because they've tasted evil. They know what it's like to give in to the temptation that can rob them of life. And they become aware of their own nakedness, which means their vulnerability. The fact that they actually now need a shield, that they, that they need to protect themselves, that they need to cover themselves, that, that anything is at risk, that the serpent that slithers is at, might be a dangerous thing, in fact. And so they make uh, loincloths out of fig leaves, and they go hide in the garden. Next day, God is walking in the garden, and Adam hears God walk in the garden and hides. And God goes, Adam? Adam goes, yeah, I'm right here. See, I was hiding because I was afraid. And God goes, Adam, have you eaten of the fruit? God already knows where Adam was. God already knows that he's eaten. And Adam goes, yes, but in my defense, Eve gave it to me. That's straight out of his mouth. The very first thing he goes, Eve did it. She's the one who gave it to me. Just to be clear, it's her fault. And then he goes worse. And he goes, and you made her. This is what, Eve, this is what Adam does. He blames Eve, and then he blames God. Oh, poor pitiful Adam. That's puny. That is not good. That is not okay. But that's what he does. And then God turns to Eve, and she goes, serpent, spoke to me, and I was duped. I was convinced, and I ate, and I shared. And God shares with us the nature of our human life, that the reality that there are spiritual battles, there are things that would rob us of life, even in the gardens of life, even in the places that we think are set apart from having risk. There's no place in which we don't need to be aware of our responsibility to be strong in faith to bear our faith. There's no place in which we're like, ah, this doesn't matter anymore. There's no place where we can let go of our righteousness and take up self-righteousness. Let go of our peace and say, let's, okay, it's okay to hate in this moment. That's not okay. None of those things are okay. Even in the garden, it's important to know that there are going to be temptations in life. And so God says to Adam and Eve, reality is you're, you're going to have to labor in childbearing, and you're going to have to labor to bring forth bread from the earth. And this serpent is cursed with an enmity that Eve, your children, and the serpent will always have a, a battle between each other. And it's true, by the way, in human history. Uh, snake predation on children is a major issue, especially in very rural, very primitive locations. It has been our situation for humanity for many, many, many years. This is there's such truth in this narrative, and it's born because of a willingness to put away the shield of faith and to trust in things like, I don't need it, or I don't, it's okay to supplant God's words with my own. And so, what about the other end of that? There's this beautiful message in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10. Jesus is with his disciples, and he's going, look, we're on this side of the fall of humanity. We're not in the garden anymore. I need you to be aware that if you're going to go forth in my name, you need to activate your faith because there will be struggles. Can I get an amen? There will be struggles. 
And they come from without and from within, near and far, they're going to come. And he says, so this is what I want to say to you. This is what Jesus says to his disciples. It's not the best pep talk, but it's true. And he goes, they're going to drag you before synagogues and trials, and your family is going to be upset with you and desert you, and, and all kinds of horrible things will happen to you in my name. So have fun with that. <laughs> but he goes on, he goes, but do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. He's saying, bear a shield of faith. As you go forth in those moments, he says, be as wise as a serpent, but as innocent as a dove. I love this. This is, this is what it looks like to protect our integrity and also not be naive. He's saying, be aware that there are struggles and you need to be clever and God has given you a brain, so use it. But here's the thing, never sacrifice that which is valuable in the journey. There are going to be people coming at you willing to do things that you should not be willing to do in response because you're a follower of my name, because you're carrying a shield with my name on it, a shield of faith. So preserve your integrity, preserve your trust in God, and believe and act upon it as opposed to what the world throws at you or what those who would call themselves enemies of you would throw at you. Be wise as a serpent, but be innocent as a dove. And as you come before the councils and the people drag you before and you don't know, you, you can be worried, oh, but am I prepared? Am I prepared? Do I have all the right words? Am I eloquent enough? Have I, have I, am I bright enough to respond to those moments? Jesus says, yeah, but that's not, this is what I want you to hear me say, Jesus says. Do not worry about what you're going to say or how you're going to respond in those moments. Know that it is I, the Father, who speaks through you in those moments. You are not alone in that moment. I am your strength. I am with you. And so I hear Jesus say to us an example of bear a shield of faith. Bear a shield. And that's what I say to you. That's the point of the sermon, by the way, if you haven't picked up on it. That's the point of the sermon. Activate your faith. Bear a shield of faith. Now, if I see any of you walking down the street this week carrying a shield, an actual shield, I'll be like, you didn't get the point. Carry it spiritually. Carry it in your heart, carry it in your mind. Know that you're not able to, to thwart everything that comes at you because of your own intellect or integrity or strength. But in Christ's name, you can do all things. And what is faith? It is, as Nicole was reminding us, it's assurance of things hopeful, certainty of things not seen. It's the evidence of things not seen, as King James says, right? It's saying, look, I, I, I'm... I can, I, because I don't see love, I can believe that there is no love, but there is love. And I'm going to hold on to it. I'm holding on to it. I'm holding on to God's love, and I'm holding on to mine. And I'm not going to sacrifice that or let go of it or throw it down because there's things coming at me. I'm, I'm going to carry it, and I'm going to recognize that I can activate my faith, and it can be a great strength to me. And so activate your, your faith, activate the shield of faith, and do so in Christ's holy name. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand and turn in your bulletin as we join together in this ancient and historic affirmation of our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
announcements. Giving of your tithes helps us to continue God's work in our community and throughout the world. Please use the QR code located on the back of the bulletin or use the offering boxes in the back of the church to give your tithes today. You can also give your time today after this service to help package 11,000 meals for Ukraine through Convoy of Hope. All hands on deck for this opportunity to feed those with difficulty getting food because of the war. There is no need to register. Just meet us outside after this service. This Monday, May 23rd, you are invited to a Zoom discussion on how to reduce school anxiety by Dr. Marcia Grinnell from 8 to 9 p.m. If you are a concerned parent or a student who struggles with any school anxiety, you don't want to miss this discussion. Dr. Grinnell will talk about strategies from how to reduce text anxiety to decision anxiety. Next week will be June, halfway through the year. Here are a few upcoming events. Pancake breakfast is next Saturday, June 4th at 8 a.m., yummy, yummy. Town hall meeting on June 12th at 10.15 a.m. And coffee with the pastor is also on June 12th at 12.30 p.m. You can find more information on events and ministries in the e-newsletter or on the calendar page of the website. So please stand to sing Jesus Calls Us, our final hymn. now receive our blessing to go forward but I give it to you today with five minutes before 12 which means you got all the more time to help with the mission outside so let us go forth to be hot outside but to do a good work to the Lord all right let's receive our blessing children of God you've come to worship now go forth in the spirit of service in God's holy name go forth in the name of God the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit amen, amen.